abiding in his sanctuary. In a little bit, we're going to go to Psalms 91, a very, very familiar passage of scripture. What is a sanctuary? What are we talking about this morning? A place of refuge, a place of protection, a haven from outside distractions, a safe place to be. Sanctuary. How many of you at one time or another, when you walked into this sanctuary, this OCC sanctuary or a church sanctuary, if you will, talking about a physical place, this place is set aside as God's sanctuary, God's holy place. How many came in seeking shelter, seeking something? Sometimes you didn't quite know what you were seeking, but you came. And as you were warmly greeted by the ushers, as you were ushered to your seat and you began to center in, and as the Holy Spirit began to move, as the musicians played, as the choir sang, as the preacher preached, and the word went forth and began to penetrate the very depths of your soul, you came to a place where you didn't really want to leave. You wanted to stay there. How many have been there? You wanted to stay there. You said to yourself, wow, if I could only stay right here, for this is good. If only I could stay right here, sheltered from the storms of life, sheltered from all the distractions, sheltered from all that stuff. If only I could stay right here in this holy sanctuary, I'll be all right. For I knew that his presence is here. If I could feel this way all the time in this holy place, I know I'll be all right. For the Lord surely is in this place. Because see, you'd been in his presence. You'd had an experience. His anointing had filled the house, and you wanted nothing more than just to rest and abide in him. You wanted to rest and abide in this peaceful place. Similarly, you know, women, when we go on a retreat and how the Holy Spirit begins to minister to us, and you just don't want to leave. I heard a songwriter say one day that if you've ever been in God's presence, you won't ever leave the same way you came in. The sanctuary, a place of refuge, a place of protection, a place where you draw strength from your brothers and sisters, a place where you feel loved and care. Sanctuary where all the insanities of the world can't touch you. Well, we're going to be talking for the next few minutes or so not about a physical place, not about this sanctuary. We're not going to be talking about a place that's made of brick and mortar, if you will, okay? We're going to be talking about what it means to abide in his sanctuary, his holy place, his secret place, a spiritual place where we really don't ever have to leave, where no clocks are ticking, where no crowds are gathering, where the only music that's coming forth is from our very spirit, Connecting to his spirit. With the only voice that we hear is his sweet, sweet voice beckoning to us to come unto his presence. We're going to talk about a visitation this morning. His secret place where we can abide in his sanctuary forever. You see, we are his temple. We are housing around his temple. And within this temple, there's a room, you see, and it's a sanctuary. That's where we can go. We can retreat within this house, within this, this room, where we can get away from everything and anybody that's distracting us. Let's go over to Psalms 91. I think David knew a little bit about retreating into this sanctuary. Psalms 91, and we'll read verses 1 and 2. That's Psalms 91, 1 and 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 2. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. My God. Let's go to Psalms 27 and 5. Psalm 27 and 5. David knew a little something. I think he knew a little something about hiding, seeking a hiding place. You see, he had gone through some things. For in 1 Samuel 18, chapter, 1 Samuel 18 and 19, David continually to seek refuge to get away from King Saul. King Saul during that time was trying to kill him. Three times Saul sent messages unto David to kill him, but each time God intervened. So in Psalms 91, David
David knew something about dwelling in a secret place and about God's protection. And then he also talks about it in Psalm 27 and 5. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon set me up upon a rock. He shall set me up upon a rock. We're talking this morning about abiding in his sanctuary. How many know that sometimes people will rise up against you in attempts to discourage you, in attempts to sway you, in attempts to cause you to doubt God? But don't we know that God will turn that situation around for our good? God will make your enemies your footstools. For if you abide in him and allow his word to abide in you, the word of God lets us know there was no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. Talking about b- abiding in a secret place. And his holy sanctuary, a safe retreat. You see, in this place, there is peace. There is peace that surpasses all understanding. You say to yourself, well, I don't have all the answers, but God does. I don't know why these things are happening to me at this particular time, but God does. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. You see, In this place, in his sanctuary, his pavilion, we can draw strength from our Father. Psalms 96 and 6. Psalm 96 and 6. We're talking about abiding in his sanctuary. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Abiding in his sanctuary. Psalm 46 and 1. Psalm 46 and 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He is a very present help in trouble. You see, when you can rest in the sanctuary, he'll put a new song in your heart. He'll put a new dance in your steps. Psalm 59, 16 says, but I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble, a place of refuge, an answer against all odds. When the enemy whispers to you, try to get you to give in, telling you defeat is near, you can draw strength from God's word, and you can sing of his mercies, new mercies every day. When the enemy whispers to you and attempts to get you to give up, you can draw strength from just knowing that my God, your God, if he said it, that's all that matters. Nothing else really matters. It doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter what things are going on around me, how they're looking. God is my defense and my refuge in the day of trouble. You see, when we rest in him, when we rest and abide in his sanctuary, we retreat from the cares of this world. For we remain confident that although we are in this world, we are overcomers through Christ Jesus. Although we are in this world, 1 John 5, 4 tells us, 1 John 5, 4. Although we're in this world, we're going to go through some stuff. But 1 John 5, 4 tells us that we are already overcomers. Praise God. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Even our faith through Christ Jesus. So in the time of trouble, we can take comfort because we can go to the rock. We can go to the rock. Psalm 62, 7, I'll read that. Psalm 62, 7 says, And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. You see, when we put our complete trust in God, I mean our complete trust. In God, knowing and believing that all of our needs are met through Christ Jesus, we'll take comfort in these psalms. There's another psalm I want to read to you, Psalm 55 and 22. Psalm 55 and 22 tells us to cast your burden upon the Lord, and he shall do what? He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. And we all know 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him. For he cares 
for you. Do you believe the word this morning? Do we believe? Isn't it a good place to be resting and abiding in his word, retreating from a world that's so full of hatred, pride, bickering, self-righteousness? Retreating from a world that's so full of confusion, devastation, turmoil, bitterness, and strife. Retreating from a world that basically is so full of sin. Those of us who are in him know that we can go to him once and for all. We can rest in him. There is nothing but bad news in the media these days. Prices soaring, crimes are going up. But we know in him there is good news. So I come this morning just to share some good news with you. Okay, just some good news. I bring you good news today because in the midst of this stuff, in the midst of everything that's going on around us, God still is. How many know that all, with God, all things are possible? So see, there's good news, you see, and I just want to encourage you this morning that we're talking about a God, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he took care of my situation last week, if he took care of my situation last month, then I know that because he is the same God, I don't have to worry I don't have to fret. I can rest and abide in him. If he promises to sustain us, if he promises to keep us, if he promises to always be in us, guess what? We can rest on that. Amen. We can rest on that. The word of God lets us know that we need to cast our burdens on him. We've heard that so many times. But how many know he's well able? I say he's well able to do everything that he has promised. He reminds us in Hebrew 10, 35, to cast not away, therefore, our confidence. In other words, to keep that faith, to keep that faith. Cast your burdens upon him and then maintain your confidence. That's resting in him. That's abiding in his sanctuary. Hebrews 10, 36, 4, ye have need of patience. Woo, patience. We don't want to go there, do we? That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise patience hmm we really don't want to talk about that this morning do we patience i wonder if that has anything to do with going through stuff patience you see in his sanctuary we can go through stuff but we can still have joy james 1 reminds us that in this world we're going to have tribulations make no mistake about it you're going to have trials god never promised us that we wouldn't have trials but let's go to james 1 First chapter of James, and we'll read um, first through the fourth verse. These are all scriptures of reminder. I'm sure at one point or other you've probably heard or read them or even meditated on them. I just come to encourage you this morning, that's all. I just come to encourage you this morning to rest in him, for you can abide in his sanctuary. James 1, first through the fourth verse. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Let patience have her perfect work. We don't want to do that, though. Trials. How many know trials really is an opportunity to cultivate this fruit of the Spirit? It really is an opportunity. So we should welcome the opportunity to grow us up, if you will. You see, some of us, we were just about to receive your breakthrough, and then you faltered. The light was at the end of the tunnel. You could see it. It was dim, but you could see it. But then you gave up. You were almost at the finish line, almost there, but then you quit. Well, I'm here again to encourage you today. How many know the race is not given to the swift? I said the race is not given to the swift nor the battle to the strong, that's what Ecclesiastes tells us, but to those who endure until the end. We got a race to run, but we don't run it alone. And with Christ, we can rest in him. When we abide in him, when we seek refuge in his sanctuary, we can have sustaining power. When we rest in him and abide in his sanctuary, we have deliverance power. When we abide in him and rest in his sanctuary, we have victorious power. You see, we're not in this race alone. We are to cast our cares upon him. How many know that he is yet faithful concerning all of his promises? He is yet faithful. We're going to go over to John 15 and 7. John 15 and 7. If ye abide in me, that's what the word of God says. 
and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Psalms 125 and 5 says, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abideth forever. Talking about resting in him today. Knowing, trusting, and believing that he knows what he's doing. He doesn't need our help. He knows what he's doing. Philippians 1, 6, you probably don't even need to turn there. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in us, in me, in you, will perform it. He'll perform it. That's a promise. Until the day of Jesus Christ. Are you fully persuaded this morning? Are you confident? We say we believe the word of God, but do we really? We say we trust him, but do we really? We say we wait patiently upon him, but do we really? What does our actions say? How do we respond when our backs are against the wall? When our backs are against the wall and we in the natural can't see our way out, do we come out fighting on our own, trying to take this matter into our own hands? Or do we take refuge in the knowledge that the battle is really not ours, it's the Lord's? And guess what? He's already won it. He's already won it. So we've got to get to that point, brothers and sisters, where his word becomes alive in us. It's not enough just to read his word. We've got to allow his word to take root in us so that we know that we know that we know that we know that God's promises are truly yea and amen. If he promised to keep us, we can rest assured that he will. If he promised in a day of trouble that we could call upon him and he would answer us, Psalms 50 and 15, we can rest in the confidence that he will. If he promised to restore our souls, as he does in Psalms 23, we can rest and abide in his sanctuary. If he promised to set a table before us in the presence of of our enemies. What are we worried about? All comes down to this. Whose report are you going to believe? Whose report are you going to believe? Do we believe the word of God? It's a simple question. We go over to Psalms 100 in a little bit. Psalms 100. Do we really know who God is? Who are we talking about this morning? If you really take the time to meditate, to focus, and to just listen to what he has to say to us, Not just during this time, but through his Holy Spirit as we go throughout the day. Do we really know who God is? Well, I believe Psalms 100 reminds us of who he is. Let's read Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. That's it. It is he that have made us, and not we ourselves. Mm. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Do we believe that God who made us knows all about us? Do we believe that God who knew, made us and knew us even before we were born and formed in our mother's wombs knew all about us? If we believe this, if we believe this, why do we put our trust in man? He's our shepherd. We are his sheep. So why not just abide? In his sanctuary. If we we believe the word of God in Psalms 23, it'll mean something to us. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. So just rest and abide in his sanctuary. You see, when this scripture becomes alive in us, we will become alive in it. We'll rest in him completely. In order to rest in him completely, we've got to trust him. We've got to trust him totally without reservation. We've got to trust and depend on him for every situation. There is no little situation that he doesn't want to handle. We go to him oftentimes with the big things. What about the little things? The word of God tells us go to him. Go to him. So I want to go back and revisit Proverbs, the third chapter. I mentioned that earlier. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Talking about trusting in the Lord. Trusting. Because, see, I believe the key to resting in him, to seeking refuge in him, to abiding in his sanctuary, is trusting in him. Proverbs 3rd chapter, 5th and the 6th verse. 
Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. What does this mean? What does it mean to you? It doesn't mean to rely on our own intellect. It doesn't mean to rely on what we think. It doesn't mean to rely on our mind. How many know we're supposed to have the minds of Christ? Amen. Our minds will fool us sometimes. Sometimes, how dare I say all the time. Something's happening in my life that just goes against reasoning. What shall I do? Lean not to my own understanding. Well, you don't know my situation, sister. It's easy for you to tell, tell me that. It's easy for you to say trust him. But if he, you were in my shoes, you'd be wary too. Trust in him. Lean not unto your own understanding. Well, how can I trust him? How can I rest in him when all the world all around me is going crazy? When the world all around me is like seeking sand? Well, if you have to ask that question, then you need to follow up and ask yourself another question. Do I really know him? Do I really know him? You see, it's impossible to trust someone if you don't know him. Bring it over to the natural. The person is probably closest and dearest in your life. Envision that person for a minute. And envision that person is standing behind you. And he tells you, just fall back. Fall back and I'm going to catch you. Well, are you going to fall back and trust and believe that he's going to catch you? Are you doubting and wondering in your mind, well, I could get hurt. I could hit the floor. I don't know he really does have my back or not. I'm hearing him. It sounds like his voice. I believe he's back there. He's telling me to go ahead, fall backward. But I'm still wondering, how much does he really love me? Is he really going to catch me or is he going to let me fall? Sometimes, I say sometimes you got to depend on those situations when you don't really can see your way through. You better, better know how to lean and trust on God. You see, if you hesitate, if you say, well, I don't really know if God's going to catch me. I really don't know if he really got my situation. I really don't know if he's got my back. Nothing can build up our confidence more than a past experience. What has happened in the past? Did God take care of me in the past? Did God take care of me in the past? Did he have my back in the past? You see, you won't hesitate to fall backward if you know that that person in the physical has taken care of you in the past as far as falling, you falling and him catching you. You had trust. And through the years, you began to lean and depend. You knew that person got your back. Well, think about our father, who is greater than any natural person. Our father, who created all of us in his image. The one who sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. If you trusted him enough to save you, then why is it so difficult to trust him enough to keep us? Why is it so difficult to trust him to meet our every need? Salvation is not just a one-time experience. Salvation, nothing missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken. Don't you realize it's the same faith that you had when you enabled him to save you, when you put your trust in him, that same faith will carry you through each day? If you trust Jesus, you will land safely in his arms. You will land safely in his arms. This reminds me of a story I heard years ago. This man was in the park, and he saw this little boy, and the little boy was running around with his hand extended. Running around, he was so happy, and he was just running around. The man says, why are you so happy, son? He says, because I'm flying my kite. And the man looks up, and he says, I don't see no kite up there. What do you mean you flying your kite? And the boy says, I'm flying, and I'm flying, and I got it. And the man says, the boy, well, how do you know the kite's still up there? He said, every now and then, I feel a little tug. Every now and then, I feel a little tug, and that lets me know it's still there. It's still there. Wait, let me tell you, I come to encourage you this morning. Jesus is still there. You might not always feel him. We don't see him. We see him in his actions, but we don't always feel him. But how many know he's still there? Because every once in a while, he has sent something our way to remind us. His beautiful spirit reminds us, I'm still here. I said I would never leave you. I said I would never forsake you. I said I would be with you through all ages. I'm still here. I haven't left you. Psalms 90, Psalms 90, the first verse says, Lord, thou hast been my dwelling place in all generations. The second verse says, before the mountains were brought forth, or even thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. 
he's still here. Do we believe that the same God who sustained David through his trials is the same God who sustains us today? Are you abiding in that secret place? Are you resting in his holiness? Are you casting all your cares on him? Are you leaning not to your own understanding, but are you in all your ways acknowledging him and allowing him to direct your path? Or is it just talk? When trials, tribulations, and persecutions come, and your time of travel, tra- trouble, does your ma- mind wander off into a place of unbelief? Does your mind wander off into a place of doubt and to a place of uncertainty? Or do you take comfort in the prince of comfort? Do you find other things or places to fill your void? Do you look to family members to give you that peace? Or do you allow the prince of peace to rule in your heart? In your time of trouble, do you begin to wander off into self-pity or fear? Not believe in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So why do we wander off, wander off into the enemy's camp? Why don't we stir up the gift that's already in us? That reminds us that the Lord is our refuge and our fortress. There is strength and power in that. When you learn that things will fade away, when you learn that people will let you down, because people can't be your sanctuary, you see. When you're faced with adversities and faith with trials, tribulations, sometimes our minds we allow to go into those places where we shouldn't allow them to go. And we forget about all these scriptures that tell us, To let this man be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Oh, when will it be enough? I'm speaking to myself too. When will it be enough that we just trust in him? When will it be enough when we just put our trust totally in him? When will it be enough? If you seek those things to please the Father, you won't worry about tomorrow. Matthew 6.25, we won't take the time to read that, but Matthew 6.25 lets us know, Jesus says, don't take any thought for tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow, but I got that. Isn't it good news that he's got that? If we do those things that are in the will of God, you'll be able to rest in him, knowing and believing that he is your keeper. And knowing and believing that God, same yesterday, God, same today, God, and same tomorrow, God. How many know he's a promise keeper? He's a promise keeper. You see, God has given us everything we need to rest in him. There is peace in him. John 14, 27 says, peace. Jesus is talking here. Peace, not just any kind of peace. Peace, my peace, I leave with you. Not as the world giveth, give out unto you, the Lord says. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. John 16, 33 says, these things, Jesus is speaking, these things I have spoken unto you. That in me, ye might have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, you see. I've already overcome the world. Philippians 4 and 7 says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. He's given us everything we need. Everything we need. And just in case you ask God you need wisdom this morning, God tells us in James 1, let's turn over to James 1, 5th and the 6th verse. It's James 1, 5 and 6. He tells us to ask for it. If you don't know which way to go, he says, ask me. And my Holy Spirit will guide you through the spirit of wisdom. James 1, 5 and 6. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That give it to all men liberally and upbraid of not. And it shall be given him, verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is, is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let him ask in faith. Ask in faith. Don't waver. Don't go to the left and to the right. Ask. And then don't take a step. Don't make a move without him. For the word of God said, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Trust in him. Trust in him. We're either going to trust him or we're not. 
we're either going to trust him or we are not. Ephesians 2 and 6 reminds us that God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's abiding in his sanctuary. Then let's go to Ephesians, the third chapter. Ephesians, third chapter, 10th verse. We're talking this morning about abiding in his sanctuary. Ephesians 3 and the 10th verse. Abiding in his sanctuary, resting and, and ruling, letting allow his spirit to rule in us. Ephesians 3.10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. For the wisdom of God, how many know that's in his sanctuary? That comes from his sanctuary. And are you encouraged by Galatians 6 and 9 that tells us, and let us not be weary in well-doing? For in due season we shall reap if we, what? Faint not. So don't faint. I just come here to encourage you this morning. Don't give up. Don't faint. Abide in his sanctuary. If we're going to trust him, if we're going to believe in him, we need to abide in his sanctuary. Now I've got some more good news for you. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians, 15th chapter, we're going to be reading the 19th to the 22nd verse. The reason I wanted to go over there, because see, this ain't the end of the story. This is not the end of the story. Sometimes you've got to use bad grammar to get your, word, your point across. So this ain't the end of the story. If in this world only, the word of God tells us, but this is not it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, 19th to the 22nd verse. If in this life only we, hope, we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Amen. 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. See, during this time, Paul was trying to encourage, he was in attempts to encourage the church of Corinthians. Some started gossiping among themselves. Some started talking. Some started to turn their backs on God. Some were even wondering, did he really die? Because they were seeing their loved ones who were persecuted and gone on before them. They said, will we ever see them again? Is this all we got to it? To, to look forward to. So Paul, the apostle Paul, said, I just need to remind y'all of something. That all these things that I've already told you, they did happen. And so this is not the end of the story, you see. For and if, in the, if, if in this life only you have hope, you're already miserable. But I thank God, brothers and sisters, but we can hope. We can rest. We can abide. We can know that one day, one day, we're going to be with him forever. So this is not the end of the story. Isn't that good news? Ephesians, the first chapter. Let's go to Ephesians, the first chapter. This is more good news. The fourth verse. Um, let's read Ephesians, first chapter, the fourth verse. Let's just read the fourth verse first. According as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We can rest. And abide in his sanctuary. Verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Christ, Jesus Christ to himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. Knowing that it is his good pleasure to have adopted us. So he's adopted us. So we can rest and abide in his sanctuary. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Seven. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, mm. according to the riches of his grace. According to the riches of his grace, knowing that we have been redeemed by his blood. That's good news. That knowing that we have been forgiven of our sins, that's good news. According to the riches of his grace. You see, we can rest and abide in his sanctuary. Verse 8 and verse 9. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, 
according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself. Knowing, full knowing, having the knowledge that he had a plan and a purpose for each one of us is good news. And that it's not over until it's over. So we can rest and abide in his sanctuary. Verses 10 and 11. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. According to the purpose of him who worketh all things, not just some things, all things after the counsel of his own will. Knowing all of this, plus the fact that we have already obtained an inheritance, but we are a royal priesthood, we can rest and abide in his sanctuary. Verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Who first trusted in Christ. That's why it's so important to continue to trust in him. With complete confidence, we can finally rest and abide in his sanctuary. If ye abide in him and let his words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it will be done unto you. For if you abide in him, you won't have a desire to ask him for anything that goes contrary to his will. If you abide in him, you'll be like Jesus and only want to do, the, to do those things that please the Father. If you abide in him, he will be well pleased. For then and only then, it will be your Father's good pleasure to grant you your heart's desires. Abide in his sanctuary, not being swayed by what's happening all around you. Not being swayed by what's going on, on to your left. Not being swayed by what's going on to your right. Not being swayed by what's already happened in your past. Your past is your past. Your past does not define your future. My past does not define where I'm going. I might not have had a great past. I might not have had a great, um, I might not have even known who my mother was. I might not have known who my father was. I might not have known anything about my family. But guess what? My past does not define my future. Because I got a, I'm, I've got a new family, you see. I've been adopted by Christ, you see. Abide in his sanctuary. I'm abiding. I'm arresting. I'm ruling in him. Abide in his sanctuary. I'm allowing the peace of God to continually rule in my heart. External factors won't even be a factor. I said external factors won't even be a factor. Abiding in his sanctuary in the secret place of the most high. We're only he and I are. So you can't get there. You can't get there. Abiding in him. You can't get there if for me is what I'm saying. And where he is resting, ruling in me, where I can retreat to, I can shut y'all out, you see. Because it's just about Jesus. It's just about Jesus. When you abide in his sanctuary, the words of this old familiar song will remain alive in your heart. There's an old song, and I don't know if you, you recall this or not, but it says, What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. I'm leaning. I'm leaning. Leaning safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning. I'm leaning. Leaning on the everlasting arms. And the second verse is, oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning. On the everlasting arms. You know who we're talking about this morning? We can lean on. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. So I'm leaning. Not on my husband. I'm leaning. Not on my daughter. I'm leaning. Not on my brothers and sisters. I'm leaning. Not on my parents. But I'm leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus. I'm abiding in his sanctuary for where there is love. For how many know he is love? Abide in his sanctuary where there's peace, for he is the prince of peace. Abide in his sanctuary where there's joy, unspeakable joy. Abide in his sanctuary where there's wisdom. What a mighty wise and mighty God we serve. Abide in his sanctuary where there's good news that Jesus heals, that Jesus saves, that Jesus delivers. I'm abiding in him. 
I'm not worried about what's going on around me. Things are going to happen all around me. For the word of God has already told me that. But I'm going to lean on the everlasting arm. I'm not going to worry about my past. I'm not even going to worry about tomorrow. For God's got that. I'm going to lean and trust on God. I'm going to lean not to my own understanding. And all, my, all of our ways, I'm going to acknowledge him. Because he told me he's going to direct my path. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to fret. I've got to go back out there. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. I got a new mind in Christ Jesus. I'm going to trust him. I'm not going to doubt. I'm going to lean on the everlasting arm. I'm not worried about what people say to me. I'm not worried what my boss may say. I'm not worried about my family what might say. I'm going to lean and trust on Jesus. I'm going to retreat to that place where only he is. I can rest and, and be assured that Jesus is my refuge. Refuse, a place, a fortress, a place of protection. I'm leaning on the rock, the rock of my salvation. I'm leaning. I'm going to the rock now, y'all. I'm going to the rock, a place that's greater than me. For he said he would set me upon the rock. Who is this rock? Jesus. I can lean and depend on him. As we stand all over the church, let's just begin to praise him this morning for giving us an opportunity to, to lean on him. For giving us an opportunity to be reminded of just who he is. For giving us an opportunity to know that we can worship him in freedom. For the word there is, the spirit of liberty is, there is freedom. How many know in his spirit, in his sanctuary, there is peace? In his spirit, in his sanctuary, there is peace. There is liberty, there is freedom. Everything I need, he's already provided. So you may be thinking to yourself, I don't feel well in my body. Guess what? He's the prince he is the healer of all healers. The doctor may have given you some news that you didn't expect, but guess what? He is the doctor that's never lost a patient. The lawyer might have told you this case is not even worth fighting for because it's already lost, but guess what? He's the lawyer above all lawyers. I'm telling you, you walk into that courtroom, and you don't know which way going to go, but then you stand before the judge. Someone else walks in, and that's Jesus. And he says, I'll take her case, God. I'll take her case, judge. I'll take it. I'll take it. And so you look back. You know you sinned. You know you're guilty. You know you did those things that you've been accused. But Jesus said, I'll take it. I've already paid for it. Your case is dismissed. And you walk off free. You can walk off free knowing you're walking in his freedom, you see. Knowing you're walking in his freedom because he's already paid the price on Calvary. I'm talking about Jesus. God, who sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus, who taught, thought it not robbery, to stand there, to be on that cross, stretched wide between two thieves. Everything they did to him, he took it for us. He took it for us. His father, our father, even had to turn his back on his son on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had to turn his back on his son, not because of his son, but because of us. And because of us, this day, because of what Jesus did, because he rose from the dead, all power in his hands, and because of that, we can rest in him. We can go into the sanctuary where there's rest in the sanctuary. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for allowing us to rest in you. Thanking you, Father, for giving us that peace.